Hi, I'm G.A. Coleman, and that's Jennifer Hess, and this is Real Reviews Rewind, the show where we rewind the clock a little bit and talk about some older films. And this is Real Reviews Rewind Home Edition, as usual, where we talk about older films that are going to be in your homes. And this week, we have a particularly interesting selection of films, because my brain never stops coming up with ridiculous movies for us to watch while we're all still sheltering in place. Uh, this week's selections are Little Nemo Adventures in Slumberland and Kung Fu Hustle. Um, now let's, even when you told me the title the very first time, my first instinct was, oh, it's the Finding Nemo sequel. But let's tease the audience with, it's not. Yeah, it's definitely not a Finding Nemo sequel. I really uh, did think that at first. So. So uh, what do you want to start with? Do you want to start with Kung Fu Hustle? Or do you want to start with Little Nemo? Well, it is martial arts May, so let's start with Kung Fu Hustle. Right. So your turn to talk about the plot of Kung Fu Hustle. Oh, wait, wasn't it mine? No, because I had Little Nemo, so it is your turn. That's Go right. Ahead. That's right. So Kung Fu Hustle is a 2004 film directed by and starring Stephen Chow. Um, the film starts off with quite a sequence that really is an impressive opening shot. And we, go, we learn about the Axe Gang, which is just the most terrifying gang you could ever possibly imagine, partly because they have axes as their weapon, which is a pretty cool weapon, is, if you gotta admit, in a martial arts movie. Yeah, so, of course. Yeah, the Axe Gang is widely feared. And as the movie starts, uh, we are then taken to a sort of courtyard of a complex that is owned by a single husband and wife who are sort of just referred to as the landlord and the landlady. And within that complex, well, there's maybe 100, 150 people who live and have different little shops. And pretty much the rest of the movie takes place within that complex. And right at the beginning of the movie, we're introduced to two ne'er-do-wells who are posing as members of the Axe Gang and have come in and tried to rob some people in the complex. Well, that doesn't go well. And uh, eventually what happens is that we learn that some of the people who live in the complex are actually Kung Fu masters who are hiding in, um, you know, in, in um, undercover, so to speak, or have gone back into private life. So the two men who pretend to be part of the Axe Gang actually happen to run into the Axe Gang right outside, which is quite a coincidence, but important for the plot. And then the Axe Gang gets involved. And from that point forward, we pretty much have an escalating process between the people who live in this housing complex, uh, you know, run by the landlord and the landlady and the Axe Gang. And were it not for the three initial Kung Fu masters who we meet at the beginning, one of whom basically just carries around sacks on his back, a uh, second of whom makes, they call him, in the translation, they called him Donut, but I assume it's yeah. some sort of more, you know, specific, uh, you know, Chinese uh, confection. And then the third one is a tailor. And those three men were introduced to and were sort of shown their different prowess and fighting styles, which is pretty cool. They have a lot of fun with that. Um, now, the movie takes a little bit of an interesting turn about halfway through when this big culminating battle occurs because the Axe Gang has brought in some assassins to battle with these Kung Fu masters. And there's some pretty cool staged scenes, which leads to, however, a little bit of a plot spoiler, all three of the Kung Fu masters being killed. Meanwhile, one of the Nerdu Wells, who sort of uh, we learn is just this hopeless incompetent as a, as a, as a thief, actually winds up getting beaten into a, a severe pulp um, but is actually saved by the landlord and landlady who turn out to be Kung Fu masters also. In yeah. fact, they are such great Kung Fu masters that they don't even want to use their skills because they've committed not to for personal reasons. Then is brought in the ultimate master by the Axe Gang, who then is going to have a huge showdown um, with the uh, landlord and landlady. I'm sorry, he's the one who beats up the ne'er-do-well. And then finally, the ne'er-do-well, who's been beaten to a pulp, metamorphosizes and comes out as the butterfly uh, fighter who then turns around and becomes the greatest master of them all. So the movie, uh, that's, that's my summary of the plot. So now I'm going to tell I you mean, about I the movie. I feel like that's really well done. I, 
All I right. had flashbacks listening to you tell the tale. But go ahead. <laughs> yeah, no. Well, now let's color it in some. So, you know, right, right off the bat, one of the things I really liked about this movie is that, you know, this guy who's one of these, one of these two sort of low level th- uh, thugs at the beginning who were just shown to be incompetent throughout the yeah. movie. And he's, he's sort of made a butt of different jokes is actually Stephen Chow, the star. And, you know, it isn't until the final maybe third of the movie when he metamorphosizes into this great kung fu master that, you know, he really becomes, you know, the star of the movie. But up until that point, I liked the way he played the character. I thought that was a lot of fun. He was, he was kind of a butt of jokes. I mean, for me, Stephen Chow, the reason this movie works is because he's more than just bumbling. Like, Jackie Chan has played bumbling before. Yeah. And, and it's worked in many of his movies. Stephen Chow's character is just straight up incompetent. (laughs) And watching him be incompetent and rooting for him to be better is half the fun of the movie. The other half of the fun of the movie is the fights. Yeah, well, so, the okay, but, you know, let's go back. So quickly, let's touch upon Stephen Chow again. I mean, you know, we talked in the past couple of weeks about, for example, how Bruce Lee was just blah, you know, in, in Enter the Dragon and Jet Li was kind of the same in, in Romeo Must Die. But yeah, Stephen Chow had a lot more personality. And in fact, I really enjoyed his character in the first two thirds of the movie. I liked his character less in the last third because it was kind of boring, you know. That's because it got too easy. Yeah. That's because it got too easy. Yeah. No, let's talk about the fights. Um, so, go, go ahead. ahead. What was your favorite fight? I'm curious. I have one myself. Whew. Um, probably my favorite fight is when those, uh, when the first time that the three sort of uh, local people turn, you know, expose themselves as Kung Fu masters and you have this kind of big fight scene. Um, I just like, I like their different styles. You know, the one guy had these big, heavy kind of bracelets that he wore and yeah. another guy had the staff. Um, so that was cool. What, what was your favorite fight scene? Same fight, but for a completely different reason. Okay. So I like the tailor yeah. when, he, when he comes out and does his thing. But I really like the villain who uses her musical instrument, which is basically the equivalent of like a violin and an accordion mixed together. And the actual note and wind movements of that device that... Generate a uses. weapon that flies through the air and cut people in half. Exactly. Yeah, that was a little... I thought that was just so wildly <laughs> creative that I, I never lost sight of how interesting that was. And then watching the other masters fight that one character to try and succeed, amazing. Right. For what well, it, it is. It, I, I do like the fact that they sort of had introduced these three really great characters, and especially one of them seems to be more powerful than the other two. He is immediately decapitated during that fight. Exactly. And like- in, in fact, he's the most showy out of the three. He's like, I can do this. It's my time to really show you what I've got to do. Is done. Right, right. Yeah, so that, that was a nice sort of, you know, twist against the expectation. But, I, you know, I guess that's my big complaint about this movie was the parts where it just went beyond, like, straight up Kung Fu movie into just absolute fantasy. So, you know, you mentioned the sort of deadly notes. Um, I also, you know, on a similar bent, I didn't really like the kind of roadrunner, wily coyote scenes. That just didn't seem to be needed to me. They were just doing these extended crazy things. Like the, the land lady and her movements were very Looney Tunish, cartoonish, and I didn't really jive with that it didn't age well for me at all and i in fact didn't even like it on my first time through when i originally watched this movie when it was released in 2004 2005 had you Um, seen it since then i had not neither had i so i think we so we had both seen this 15 years ago you know i would say in general that age is okay but yeah those silly silly scenes are just not needed and you'll find that as a key of his other earlier work as well, when you look at Shaolin Soccer, that, that same cartoonishness does exist. Hmm. Um, with the same exact principle of a down and out person rising to a point of glory, essentially. Okay. Um, 
Well, you know, I'll tell you uh, one, one other thing about this movie that I, I kind of really enjoyed personally was that besides Stephen Chow, who was not really a spring chicken either, all of the other Kung Fu masters were older, um, yeah. including the characters that, I mean, the sort of bad guy in ones. And I, I thought the actual, the one that I really enjoyed the most as a character was the guy who was just the best. You know, they were, he, they were the one, he was the one they had, he broke him out of jail. Yeah. And, and I love that because they bring in this guy and he's just kind of this old guy with like, you know, he's balding, but he's got like long hair kind of flopping over his head and he just looks very, you know, pathetic. I'm assuming? Yeah, I'm assuming better, yes. Uh, but I just loved his character. He was just such a badass. He's like, you know, I, 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 you don't have to pay me because I've been waiting for somebody who is worthy of fighting. I will do this for yeah, free. Yeah, you know? yeah. The bravado of that that one character is priceless and unmistakable. Yeah, and um, deservedly so because he kicked everybody's butt. He pretty much for, did. They were so great. Yeah. So great. So, is this a movie you'd recommend? Oh, that's a tough one. I mean, you got to be in the right frame of mind for this. You know, first of all, you 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 need to. It's it's a weird subgenre of a comedic arts western. Say again. Of martial arts western? Um, well, I wouldn't call this as a one of western as much. I, w- I was going to go with martial arts comedy. Um, uh, which, w- in what ways would you classify this? I, 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 I thought you made the good point last week, but what would what would you say ties this into a western genre? So here's what ties this into a western genre for me: you've got a town full of people who are all unique, distinct characters, okay. and you have three or four heroes who, like Clint Eastwood, say. I'm done with this chaos. I'm done with this BS. I'm going to hide out and live my private life. And they've been doing so for such a long time. Right. And, and this Axe gang basically provides them a call to action that they initially, much like Eastwood in his films, especially in Unforgiven, right. chooses to ignore until it's impossible to do so. And then, much like Unforgiven, the most badass of them all is not the man who succeeds in the fight, but the man who chooses the path of least resistance pretty much all the way through the movie until he can't, until he's lost too much. And then he becomes the biggest badass of them all, which is Stephen Chow's character of Singh. Um, That's what makes it feel like a Western for me. The martial arts part speaks for itself. The rest of it feels like a Western to me. I got to give you credit on that, on that, on backing that up. That was awesome. All right. So, so do you recommend Kung Fu Hustle? I absolutely do. Just try and dismiss the woman running like a freaking chicken. (laughs) Yeah, anymore the Roadrunner's piece comes out. Yeah. Try and dismiss that when she gets upset and does that really crazy dumb crap because it's not really worth it. Um, and makes it feel like it's a bad dream sequence. And speaking of dream sequences, our next movie is Little Nemo Adventures in Slumberland. A um, movie made in, I believe, 1989. And the premise of this film is very simple. Uh, Nemo is a kid in suburban America. He really wants to go to the circus to see these circus performers, but his family is too busy to take him. They promised to take him on the weekend, but he doesn't really believe that's going to come true because they're always too busy to spend time with him. He goes to bed and he starts having small nightmares uh, rega- because he saw the uh, circus people in a um, parade sort of a event the day before. And he has nightmares about, you know, getting hurt or injured. And um, eventually... His dream, he has, becomes a reality. And it starts out very pleasant. All the characters he's seen and interacted with in the parade flip the clown who rides on a ball, the, the, the tall guy with the glasses, Mr. Cornelius, um, the, the, the huge guy with the beard, Icarus, um, mm-hmm. who actually is his friend in real life within his daily life, which I think is amazing. Um, 
tags along and he meets the king and princess of Slumberland. From there on, he's asked to take on the role of Prince of Slumberland. And he does so with immediate and severe reluctance because he's nine. And what nine or eight year old wants to play with a girl? Why would I want to play with a girl? And through that comes an adventure of him being a protector of Slumberland from the Nightmare King. Uh, what follows is that Nemo kind of, in a weird way, and I don't know how to explain this other than this, slips in and out of consciousness within the dreams that he's in. Uh, and after a terrible event forces him to take the fight to Nightmare Land, he, along with his friends, the princess, and these little muddy monsters he meets in Nightmare Land all face off against the Nightmare King uh, and use a mighty scepter to destroy the big menace that is Nightmare Land and the Nightmare King. And wouldn't you know it, at the end of the movie, he gets a sweet little kiss from the princess, wakes up, and then is being told he can go to the circus. Having said all that, you're probably wondering, well, Chike, you just told me the entire plot of the movie. Why in the world would I want to see it? And let me tell you, Adventures in Slumberland is one of those really classic, simple children's films wherein you can get lost within your own imagination. And the beauty of it is the director of this film has uh, a bit of a history with another famous artist and company, of Studio Ghibli, um, wherein he supervised all the animation and directed the film. And it's amazing work. The company that actually made this film went bankrupt shortly after, but the quality of the work, the quality of the writing of these characters, Nemo is not just some scared kid who has to get brave. He, he's a kid who, oddly enough for an eight or nine year old, thinks very deliberately through his decisions, his only real fault is that he's stubborn to a degree that can be annoying at times. But you can tell that when he meets people that mean something to him, he cares about them, he values them. And I think that's what he grew. He grew in confidence over this time period about who he wanted to be and what he wanted to achieve. And by the time that whole thing was finished, he became maybe not a better person, but a more thoughtful one. And I think that's what I connected to as a five-year-old boy watching this film for the first time. And as a 33-year-old man watching this film for the first time in at least 20 years. Sanford, what did you think of Little Nemo Adventures in Slumberland? Well, I'm glad you brought up the Studio Ghibli part because to me, you know, I, the, the plot of this movie is like secondary and I, I don't want to trash on it too bad because I'll talk about, you know, sort of the difficulty of the plot in a second. But what made this movie for me is that it was Studio Ghibli made a movie uh, or the artists from that made a movie that was for American tastes with an American plot is, you know, Hollywood, I guess Hollywood would be the better phrase. But, you know, somebody had a really good idea at that point and they executed it, you know, in the sense of having that quality of art in an animated movie when probably, you know, if you looked at what it was coming out around the same time, you know, there's a lot of bad animation made in the 80s. Um, and, you know, someone said, hey, look, the, you know, they're doing these amazing movies in Japan. Let's use these artists and let's do it in that style. But let's write a script that would play to, you know, in a Hollywood audience. Um, the script, you know, my problem with the script is that uh, the story, you know, was obviously to me, I guess, cobbled together. You know, Little Nemo was for a long time a, you know, newspaper strip, like a comic strip. And, you know, I saw that this movie was actually, the story was originally put together by Ray Bradbury, who was a science fiction writer and, a, you know, so what I assume he did, and I, I didn't research this, but I'm assuming, is that he cobbled together a couple of the different plot lines from the comic strip over the years, and they sort of threw them all together into, you know, what turned into like a 90 minute movie. 
and the plot feels cobbled together, you know, and, and it, it's a classic hero's journey, right? The quest, you know, it, it goes exactly by the book, you know, step yeah. by step on that. So it's kind of cliche. And, you know, again, if you're, if you've seen, geez, any of the Hollywood movies in the last 50 years, you're going to recognize the sort of the plot line of this movie, but it's so beautiful, you know? And, and I think especially like you mentioned the dream sequences, those are so well animated, you know, it just, it's, you'd have to go back to like Dumbo or something to say, you know, to find animation sequences that are, you know, that are as riveting, um, you know, and, and beautifully done. So. Now is it emotional though? Like I felt a little bit of an emotional component every time Nemo started to lose more. Oh, I, I didn't really care for Nemo as a character. My problem with Nemo is that um, I am a rule follower and he is a rule breaker. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, every time he does, you know, it's, you know, it's, you name it, you know, he's, he's, he's breaking into the, uh, the, to, to eat, what was he eating? The pies? You know, uh, at the beginning? I, was he the pies or cookies? Yeah, yeah. And then later, of course, breaking it, you know, which is a nice kind of, you know, metaphor, then breaking in later to the, you know, the, the one door he's not supposed to open. Yeah. You know, I just, that whole part, I was just going, no, no, you know, don't open the, you know, what are you doing? No, uh, one <laughs> yeah. little he can't hurt, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that, I didn't like Nemo. <laughs> Maybe that's mean. I don't know. No, it's not. You want to know why? Because I had the exact same feeling. I told you not to, what are you doing? But, you know, he made the point at the end that had Nemo not opened the door, then they would have not have had this eventual great victory that vanquishes the Nightmare King once and for all. So as a plot device, it works. But yeah, it was kind of like, you know, yeah. So anyway, I mean, going back to what I liked about this film were the visuals. Absolutely. 100%. Um, the plot is just an excuse to watch the movie. I will say they did one good character, um, not design, but a character plot point. What? They gave the princess agency. They made her be fiercely independent. To, a, to the same stubborn degree as Nemo, but they made her likable while doing it. You can't really like Nemo while he's doing it because he's literally got nothing to lose. And he's given everything. I mean, they're like, hey, we like you. We're going to make you the prince. <laughs> you know, and then he throws it in their face, whatever. So, yeah, she, I, I, she was a better character. I mean, I actually liked, um, what was the, the evil, the, or not the evil guy, but the sort of mischievous guy's name. Uh, Flip. Ska Flip. I liked his character. I mean, he was, con he was interesting. You know, you don't usually have a character in a film who's just kind of like, yeah, I'm bad. Check me out. I'm bad. And then he yeah. like actually is there for the bulk of the film. And um, that would be voiced by Mickey Rooney of all people. A couple of the voice actors, you know, were some well-known people. But yeah, it was. I did notice also Nancy Cartwright, who would later do Bart Simpson. Um, yeah. So, so yes, yeah. There, there was. You know, there's some interesting talent, and again, not just you know, not just recording but also creating the visuals um that that was i was really i was impressed with all the credits about the sort of character development and the you know the art it, that was and I, I noticed of course that also they had a lot of those credits up front before the film you know it's not just yeah. afterwards where you see the roles and roles and roles of all the people before the film they're like yeah these are the animators mm -hmm. so so now tell me would you recommend this film for young children yes 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 so we're talking about ages three to oh. seven mm, three to seven okay um well the concern i would have would be the sort of dark parts of the movie which yeah. aren't that scary um so you know i think it's more about what what the child is like if your child is scared easily then parts of this are kind of scary not too bad but kind of scary but would it would it be safer to say six to twelve I mean, I would go as the youngest three, depending on the kid, you know, I mean, I, and I would go probably uh, 10 or 12 would be about as high as I would go. I think older kids would kind of poo poo in this one. Yeah, I would agree. You, you um, could have them, though, you could have them touch, do touch points against the Star Wars plot line. 
Ooh, that would be fun. <laughs> the heroic quest. That would be fun. Do you, uh, do you think they would recognize it? I don't think they would. No, no. I, but, you know, you could point it out afterwards. Hey, he met a princess, and together they set off on this adventure and conquered. And hey, she had agency, dude. <laughs> yeah, right. No, he had defeated the, 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 the great, you know, bad guy um, yeah. to, to create a new time for every, whatever. Yeah. Instead of the scepter, it's a lightsaber, kids. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I really love both films. I'm glad you, you enjoyed at least one of the two. <laughs> well, you know, I always enjoy every movie and from the sense of, you know, I, I, t- you know, movie watching, this is why we do the show. This is why we, you know, we have our friendship is we, you know, we're both movie watching is an important activity in the sense that for those 90 minutes or two hours, you know, you can truly lose yourself and, right. Both of these movies, I think, were very good for that. You know, they're, they grab you into their world and sort of, you know, say, hey, look, this is a crazy different place. You know, I'm going to, you know, li- inhabit it with us for 90 minutes and then we're going to let you go back to your life. Indeed. Uh, and I think that's why um, I enjoyed those movies so much and I'm so glad you did too. Uh, so for next week, we are starting one more themed month. One more. Okay. And that would be movies of summer. So we will see you next week with our first few selections of the movies of summer. I'm going to guarantee you one of those movies has a shark in it. (laughs) Shark, Uh, Sharknado (laughs) five. Oh, do I have to? We'll have to discuss it amongst ourselves offline, but until then, I'm Chike and that's Sanford and we will see you next week. Bye guys.